This video is part two of three based on Gapinski's Healthcare Finance Chapter 8. So we're working on financial planning and budgeting. So uh, we talked a little bit about what a budget is. Now in this part of the lecture, we'll talk about the process of budgeting. So you have kind of two broad approaches to developing a budget. Uh, organizations I've been in, we've always talked about doing zero-based budgeting, but we always wind up doing pretty much conventional budgeting. So basically what a conventional budget is, you take last year's budget, you add some inflation, and then you tweak it based on what you see uh, as major changes in organizational goals or changes uh, in um, uh, things happening in the environment. So, you know, if you see you've got a new payer or uh, you've started a new service or something like that, you're going to have a, you know, you'll make changes to the budget. Um, but it is kind of basically old plus inflation gives you new budget. And that's kind of the broad uh, approach there. And the advantage here is uh, it's relatively straightforward. Everybody kind of knows what's coming. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't take up uh, lots of both the uh, time and resources to build it. And that would be both, and bear in mind, you know, this is both not just building a budget is not just like, oh, the finance shop can just do this. The finance shop has to work with uh, all the other managers to develop an appropriate budget. So the conventional budget, you know, uh, approach of that, you know, well, what was last year's, we'll add some, you know, we'll, we'll uh, make some tweaks around the edges and, and, and adjust for inflation is a, is a time saving uh, uh, and resource minimizing uh, approach. The zero based budget is basically uh, you, you throw away the old budget and you start from scratch. Um, and so hopefully that, you know, makes you a little nervous. Uh, if I, in an ideal world, you do that every year, right? In an ideal world, you'd, you'd start with the, the strategic plan. Uh, you'd look at, you know, how you want to operationalize that plan. And then you'd build budget, you'd build a budget to support the operation, or the operating plan uh, every year from, from scratch. And the advantage here is uh, under the conventional plan, things change quietly and subtly over time uh, in, in organizations. And there's a lot of what happens is there's a lot of kind of inertia in an organization when you do the conventional budget. You're like, well, they spent that much last year. We expect them to spend roughly the same amount this year. And so we'll just give them our old budget plus some inflation. And if you're not scrutinizing uh, what is being done in the organization, uh, and resetting the budget, then you can wind up you know, giving, uh, feeding some, feeding an organization that's kind of fat and flabby and starving in an organization that really needs uh, uh, more resources to grow and to better support the organization. So zero-based budgeting is, is, is ideal in the sense that you take a careful look at what the organization is doing, what it needs to do going into the future, and you fund each of the parts of the organization appropriately. In reality, that's an enormous effort, right? It's not just, it would not just be a uh, enormous effort for your finance team, but it would be an enormous effort for each of your managers who would then have to, you know, make an argument for why they need the resources that they need. And, that's not saying that under the convention, conventional approach that they aren't being required to make an argument. It's just so much more uh, effort involved. And so the, you know, the plus side of the conventional budget, the, you know, the, the pros of the conventional approach are it's, it's, it's less manpower intensive. It takes up less resources that can be therefore be used to provide patient care. Um, but it tends to codify, uh, you know, and, and play to inertia, organizational inertia. Zero-based budgeting is great in the sense that it, you know, it, it cuts out the fat where there's fat and it, and it feeds the areas that um, are, are critical for the organization's success. The downside is, you know, uh, is, is this is a, an enormous resource suck on the organization. And, you know, so resources that are being used 
to argue about budgets are not being used to provide patient care. So you have to be careful, uh, you know, in terms of asking yourself, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze, as one of my former colleagues used to like to say, right? Is, is it really worth, uh, are we really getting the amount of um, uh, uh, resources, or sorry, the amount of, of return uh, that we need for the sacrifice of resources. So there's a couple of different approaches to uh, uh, building a budget. Uh, in, in my opinion, again, an ideal is a bottom-up budget where the organization um, where the managers at the lowest level, reasonable level, develop a budget and submit it uh, for review to finance and then up to, uh, up to senior management. And this is how I tried to build budgets when I worked uh, at running a, a finance department is I would go out and work with the departments, review you know, their prior year. We would talk about their projections for the future, what they're going to be doing. Um, and then I would take that information uh, and create a package that would rep, you know, represent their department uh, and, and cluster that with all the other uh, departments that are, were under a particular senior manager. And I would bring the senior manager the whole package uh, for them to review. Um, and then that would ultimately then roll up to the, you know, to the, the CEO equivalent uh, in, in, in the military environment. Um, Top-down budget is, you know, see, uh, manage, you know, finance basically starts with some sort of specific guidance from senior management, and then is pushed down, you know, and then each of the departments says gets gets a, you know, a spreadsheet saying here's your budget, um, you know, uh, make an argument to get it to make a change. So, I, I think bottom up from my perspective and the way I was trained and the way I kind of grew up is the way to do it. Uh, I think that's the right way to do it, um, but it is time consuming because it requires, you know, it requires senior finance people to meet with, you know, leaders throughout the organization and that takes a lot of time and effort. So uh, top down is faster, um, but bottom up is, in my opinion, better, but it kind of goes back to the same, you know, argument we were having a minute ago about conventional versus zero based, right? It's all about the resources that you want to put into this process. Um, so we're going to do a simple operating budget now, and we're going to have, uh, you're going to see you know, four parts in there. Uh, the first three parts we've kind of already talked about, right? Volume is kind of the statistics budget. Then we have a revenue budget and an expense budget. And those revenue and expense budgets, because this is primarily fee for service, are tied to volume assumptions. And even when they're not fee for service, um, volume still drives. It's just a different kind, you know, volume will drive expenses and then a different kind of volume. So if it's capitated, it'll be, you know, lives, covered lives, which is a different kind of volume, it's still volume. Uh, it's still some sort of assumption, statistics assumption. And then we'll roll all that up into a pro forma, meaning a forward looking profit and loss statement, which is kind of like uh, a little income statement for, you know, below the organization level, below the reporting, you know, organization reporting level. And so into the departments and services. So here's a, a start to look at volume assumptions, right? So this is a organization that has a mix um, of both uh, uh, patients that are coming in on a fee-for-service basis as well as capitated lives. So line A, fee-for-service, so we're making an assumption. We're going to see 36,000 visits that are going to be for patients that uh, have a fee-for-service relationship with us. In other words, um, we're not being paid a per member per month fee for these people. We just get paid when they show up and use our services. So uh, the next line part or section, part B, this organization has a contract with uh, one or more payers that uh, pay the organization on a per member per month basis uh, uh, to, to provide all the services for this, you know, for this popul this capitated population. So revenues are going to be gen gen generated based on the number of capitated lives and then the number of member months because if we're paid on a monthly basis 
uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be be billing on a month monthly basis. So if we have a per member per month rate, we'll take that times the number of member months to get our annualized uh, uh, capitated reimbursement. Now that's all relevant for uh, the revenue side, but our capitated patients are going to use our facility in some at some level, right? And so there's got to be some assumption built into this about what their utilization will be. So even though we're not paid on a per uh, visit basis for our capitated people, our capitated patients, we're going to be paying to provide those visits for them, right? So they, so each visit doesn't generate revenue, but it does generate expenses. So it's still relevant to know how many visits we expect to do for our capitated patients. So what we take here is 30,000 members, right? And then we convert that 30,000 members into member months. So the way we do that is we simply multiply 30,000 times 12, and that gets us 360,000 member months. And then we say, okay, on average, our uh, members will use, uh, will have 0.15 visits per month. So if you think about 0.15 visits per month, um, that, so that would be, you know, 12 uh, months times 0.15 visits gives us an, an annual utilization of 1.8 visits per year, which is pretty low. My experience, it's more like three to four. Um, but, you know, this is just an ex academic exercise here. So, um, so uh, uh, we're projecting uh, with 30,000 uh, capitated lives that we're going to have 54,000 visits for our capitated patients and 30, 36,000 visits for our fee-for-service patients for a total uh, uh, volume of 90,000 visits. And remember, the volume has less to do, uh, the, the number of visits doesn't impact our revenue per se because it's capitated, but it does have a direct impact on our expenses, so we still need to know what it is. Okay, so now our revenue assumptions. Part A, we're breaking out our revenues from our fee-for-service versus our capitated patients. And this makes sense. And you might even go, you know, uh, you might even go further if you're, you know, in your organization and break out the revenues by payer. So you might have fee-for-service and then that's broken into, well, I've got, you know, Harvard Pilgrim and Anthem and, you know, uh, Blue Cross and so forth, right? Um, times however many visits I think I'll have from each of those, each, pay, each uh, uh, group of patients that use those particular payers. But here in this example, we're just aggregating everybody into one fee-for-service lump. Um, and so on average, we expect to earn $25 per visit for our fee-for-service patients, and we're going to have 36,000 visits. And so our fee-for-service revenue is expected to be $900,000, 25 times 36,000 gets us 900,000. Now we have, uh, then we move part B is our capitated revenues, right? And so here, it doesn't matter how many visits we have for a capitated because this is revenue. Revenue for, for fee for service is based on the per member per month or PMPM. And you can have PMPY, which would be per member per year, but we're expressing it here as PMPM. So we're paid $3 a month for each member, right? We had 30,000 members, which translates into 360,000 member months by multiplying 30,000 members times 12 months gives us 360,000 member months. We take the 360,000 member months times the $3 per member per month, and that gives us a revenue of 1.08 million. So totaling up our fee for service and our capitated revenues, we get 900,000 plus 1.08 million gives us 1.98 million for our total revenues. So we're making a projection about how much revenue we're gonna earn, and it's based on those assumptions we made in our, in our, in our statistics budget or volume estimates. Now we're gonna move into cost assumptions. So based on the number of visits that we're going to do, we assume we're going to need $48,000, 40, excuse me, 48,000 hours of labor 
at $25 an hour. And they don't provide a, a number here, but you could estimate like, you know, how many hours per visit does this take? And they would, you would have that. And then you could estimate a dollar, uh, a labor portion of the visit. We'll, we'll do that in some of the problems. Then you have a supply budget, you know, based on 90,000 visits, we think we'll need 100,000 units of supply, supply, uh, one unit of supply, so some sort of aggregated number, you know, averaging out um, uh, our supply costs. So 100,000 units of supply. So we're going to need something like 1.1 units of supply per, per, per visit because we have 90,000 visits. 100,000 divided by 90,000 is like 1.11 um, something. And so, you know, you're going to spend 1.1 1 .1, uh, uh, units times $1.50 per unit, right? Times 100,000, you know, uh, times 90,000 uh, visits, or in this case, 100,000 units times 150 a unit gives you $150,000. And so our variable costs, the, the two things that vary, right, variable cost is costs that vary directly with the utilization of our services. So if we do more visits, we need more labor. If we do more visits, we need more supplies. So those two things vary with the volume that we do. And so uh, we can average out here, taking the total cost, the total variable cost of 1.35 million, dividing it by the 90,000 visits that are expected, and we come up with an average of $15 per visit in variable costs. Part B are our fixed costs. So this organization uh, has some plant and equipment. I'm gonna skip. Uh, uh, that are direct costs, right? So these are costs that um, are specific to the organization. So plant might be, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, physical building, the cost of the physical building, and then equipment, you know, specific to the organization. Um, so, and then they get a portion of the overhead from the, from the larger organization. So fixed costs might include things like, you know, uh, lease expense for, for your, you know, or, or a, a lease on your building, that would be your plant, you know, maybe um, <clears throat> either a lease or depreciation for your equipment. And then this is, let's say this is a standalone clinic. So it's got that lease and it's got the equipment, but it's part of a larger organization. So it might physically stand alone, but it's part of a larger, say a multi-specialty practice. And this uh, clinic is off by itself. Well, it's going to also have uh, overhead from the senior leadership, uh, you know, from administration handed down to it in the form of overhead. And we've worked through this in a prior chapter. It'll have, you know, its portion of the finance department, you know, as overhead. Um, it'll have other services provided to it, HR, for example, from, from the parent organization as handed down as overhead. And so those will be fixed costs. And why are they fixed costs? Because they don't vary. Those costs don't vary with the volume that's done, right? So they're just, it's just going to be $500,000. And so the total expected costs for this organization is the variable cost, the projected variable costs of $1.35 million. The fixed costs of $500,000 gives us that $1.85 million in total expected costs. So now we can take that information and turn it into a p and um, And so the p and starts with revenues and we've got two kinds of revenue. We've got our fee-for-service revenue and our capitated revenue. Then we have costs, variable costs uh, associated with our fee-for-service, variable costs associated with our capitated. And how do we get those? Well, we took the $15 per visit times the 36,000 visits for fee for service gets us 540,000. And then we take the $15 per visit times the 54,000 visits that our capitated patients are going to do. And that's 810,000 gives us our total variable cost of 1.35 million. Um, and remember, right, it, even though capitated is driven, capitated revenue is driven by per member per month times the number of member months, uh, capitated variable costs are driven by number of visits associated with the capitated patient. So it's two different things there, right? Whereas the fee for service 
is identical, 36,000 visits times the $25 per visit, 36,000 visits times the $15 per patient. So now we get our total uh, variable cost. Subtracting our total variable cost from our revenues, we get our contribution margin. And then subtracting from the contribution margin our fixed costs and gives us our projected profit. So at this point, excuse me, at this point, uh, we have made a budget looking into the future. But uh, budgets are like any plan. Reality kind of steps in and messes up our plan. And so what we're going to, what we want to do uh, as managers or as we're looking at managers and evaluating the performance of managers, or as a manager looking at our own performance or having our performance looked at, we're going to perform a variance analysis. And the variance analysis takes the plan, right, the budget, and compares it to the actual results. And we use that, uh, that variance analysis process to identify where, where problems might be arising, where things are happening that weren't expected to happen, uh, and help us to focus on those problem areas, help managers in areas where they are maybe running into trouble. And then, and also to ask questions, you know, appropriate questions like, why is your, why are you over budget on supplies? Well, the reason I'm over budget on supplies is um, I'm seeing a lot more patients than, you know, we had planned for, or I'm over budget on supplies because uh, the pharmaceutical company we were contracting with raised its uh, you know, raised its per unit cost by 50%. And there's nothing we can do about it because that's the only pharmaceutical that, you know, treats this particular condition. So, but, but it allows us to identify those kinds of things that are happening. They pop up uh, as a result of our, our variance analysis. Or it could just be that the manager just didn't do a very good job, which is, you know, hopefully not the case, but it is, you know, a thing we're, we're trying to evaluate. So, to do variance analysis, we develop three kinds of budgets. The static, so, so we're, gonna call, we're gonna call the budget that we just built, right? The one where we were making projections, the static budget. And we call it the static budget because it doesn't change, right? Um, uh, for, real, for realized volume. So, it does, so it's built all, all on expectations. So the static budget represents what our expectations were at the beginning of the period. Then the realized or actual budget, so we're going to call it the actual budget in, in the chapter, um, is based on what really happened, right? So we have kind of our expectations and then our results. So the expectations is the static budget. The, the actual results is called the actual budget. And then the flex budget is this kind of odd animal that sits in between them. And so it, it, the flex budget takes the actual volumes um, that were uh, that happened over the course of the of the period, but uses the expected prices. So, and when I say prices, I mean the expected revenues that we thought we would get per unit of volume and the expected expenses, right? Because price is just a an, an expense is just the price we pay, the revenues are based on the price we receive. So I just refer to them both as a price, right? So it's based on an expected price, either that we're paying or receiving, and an actual volume. So what that allows us to do is compare across um, kind of an apples to apples, well, not an apples to apples, it allows us to uh, compare uh, across budgets holding either volume constant or holding price constant to determine uh, and to kind of break down uh, the uh, expenditures and profits and revenues that we achieve. So let's look a little more at this. Okay, uh, so we're gonna use this Carroll Clinic, this nominal clinic that we've built their static budget on. And we're going to now assume that they've, they've gone through the course of a year. So they projected for 2015 how things would go. 
And then now we're in January 16, the year's over and we're reflecting back. Now that we have the actual data, we're reflecting back on how man the managers did in terms of their um, uh, success uh, in the organization. So now we have, so this is, we're now into the actual budget. So the actual budget now reflects, you know, what actually happened over the course of, in this case, 2015, right? So this is not the expected or static budget that we had that we went through a minute ago. So we thought we'd have 36,000 fee-for-service visits. We actually had 40,000 visits. We thought we'd have 30,000 capitated lives. We actually had 30,000 capitated lives. So with, and hence we had, this, the, the 360,000 member months that we thought we would have. However, utilization per member per month uh, was higher than we thought. We thought we'd have a 0.15 utilization rate. We actually had a 0.2 utilization rate, which translates into a um, 2.4 visits per year per member, rather than the 1.8 per member that we thought we would have. And the thing to remember about this with capitated lives is you're trying to manage the utilization of those capitated lives because every time one of those capitated patients comes into your uh, facility and uses your resources, you don't get any more money for providing that care. You get a fixed amount of revenue, uh, you know, fixed payment from the, from the, uh, from the payer uh, but you have a variable amount of expense coming out and the higher that utilization rate is, uh, the more you spend and the less profit you make off of those capitated lives. So having a higher utilization rate is not a good thing. So <clears throat> they wound up having 72,000 visits when they originally thought um, that they would have, what was it? Uh, 54,000 visits for the capitated members for a total of 112,000 visits. So they have a lot more visits than they had originally planned on having. Unfortunately, many of those visits were capitated patients, and so they didn't receive additional uh, uh, funding for those, for those patients. So how did their revenues work out? Well, it turns out that their their actual price that they received per, uh, per fee-for-service visit was $24 when they were expecting 25. They actually had 40,000 visits. So on the one hand, they got less per visit, but they had more visits. So they wound up with $960,000 uh, in revenues from fee-for-service. So a little more revenue, um, but a lot more visits. Uh, at, a, at a lower price, their capitated lives were exactly what they thought they would be in terms of revenue, right? This does not reflect the fact, again, this does not reflect the fact that they actually saw or provided more services to the capitated patients than they thought they would. So their revenue is 2.04 uh, uh, million. Costs, so they spent, um, uh, 59,900 hours at $26 an hour <clears throat> for a 1.5, almost 1.6 million. They spent 124,800 units of supply at 188. So this is also higher. Uh, so they had a total variable cost of one point, almost 1.8 million. And when we take the total variable costs and divide it by the actual number of visits, we get a $16 per visit um, average variable cost. Their fixed costs, however, were what they thought they would be, which is kind of, uh, uh, kind of as expected. Uh, fixed costs should be fairly predictable. So their total costs were 2.292 million or 2.3 million roughly. So when we take all that and turn it into a P&L, we have 960,000 in fee for service, 1.08 million in uh, capitated, giving us a total of 2.04 million. And then our variable costs totaled out to 1.792 million, giving us a contribution margin of 248,000. Uh, with fixed costs of 500,000, they actually had a loss of 252,000. 
So that's going to, we'll take a pause here and come back and then we will line up the three budgets. We'll build the fixed, we'll build the fix, uh, excuse me, flex budget. And then we'll look at the, the static flex and actual and, and, and do uh, our variance analysis.